Good morning. Good morning. All right, that's the uh, CMCQ that we know. Uh, I would like to ask you if you could indulge me for a moment and remember to put your uh, phone on mute or, or um, vibrate or um, uh, or just how about how about even uh, even better yet how about if you just turn your phone off that would be kind of neat for an hour and a half right to turn our phones off and to be disconnected from uh, the other chatter. Now, as you have seen, we have been um, going through uh, the churches of Revelation, the seven churches of Revelation, and we're up to uh, uh, number six, and uh, the church at Philadelphia. Now, one of the things that we have been doing, and we have been making our every attempt to uh, go through an evaluation and a process of determining who we are and who we are to become and where we are in the process of becoming all that we are supposed to be in Christ Jesus as a church community. So that's the reason why uh, there are things that are changing bit by bit. There we are going through an evaluation process. We are asking everybody to fill out the surveys. They're not just for um, just for um, you know, just for information's sake. They're actually uh, to help us get a better picture of where we are and where we need to be uh, going. And we want to pray over these matters and we want to get your perspective, our perspective, and then at the end of all that, we want to get God's perspective. So this is why we're doing all of these uh, things. And I believe that the Lord will honor this because he is the one who is directing us as the Holy Spirit speaks that we will listen. Now, gracious God, we are looking forward to hearing a word from you this morning. And we wait with anticipation. So let nothing that I would say or not, none of my mannerisms or uh, my uh, deficiencies or anything distract away from what you'll say and help all of us here today to be good listeners so that we actually hear what you're saying and that we can courageously and full of grace respond to what you say and not only hear it but apply it and we know that you will give us the grace to do that if we are willing. And that, I believe, everyone in this room is. So we thank you in advance, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, America, there is a, in America, there's a general perspective on life that is foreign to Christian faith and actually is also foreign to other cultures. Some people actually believe that God wants them to be happy all the time. So what they do is they, uh, um, because they believe that, and it is partially true, but what they define as happiness, because they believe that God wants them to be happy, what they should do is do what makes them happy and then expect immediate results. And so what we do in a cultural context is that we don't deprive ourselves of any luxuries. We still think it is our right to live in comfort. To, uh, and I'm not saying, uh, I'm not talking about provision. I'm talking about living in comfort. Uh, sometimes comfort becomes so incorporated into our lives that we mistakenly take comfort for provision, for necessity. And after a while, we can't differentiate between the two. We can't tell what's necessity and what's comfort, right? So we think uh, access to air conditioning, Starbucks, hot and cold water on demand, a nice car, and 24-hour access to electricity is a necessity, all right? Uh, and actually, they're actually not. They are actually uh, provisions and comforts in many ways. When we want to lose weight, we get liposuction. We don't exercise anymore, <laughs> right? 
uh, uh, what, uh, we, uh, we get all the surgeries necessary rather than exercise and changing our diet. We think, actually, because we have an education and we make a lot of money, that it will ensure that we will be devoid of any suffering or hardship. The interesting thing about this perspective, it is a very Western perspective, but this is in contrast to other countries where people expect to suffer, no matter their status in life. I read that on one continent, the employment rate, the unemployment rate, is 40%. And highly educated people can't find work. That's people with masters and doctorates. In some countries, in general, people expect some suffering, while in America, we expect little or no suffering. Unfortunately, this aversion to suffering has also made its way into the church. Many people are being attracted to Christianity in the attractional church model with the message, put your faith in Jesus and he will make your life easy and protect you from all suffering. And unfortunately, when they enter into Christianity with that perspective, they're very quickly disillusioned when suffering for their faith occurs, and many fall away when that happens. That message that we have of no suffering is in stark contrast to the experience of the church at Philadelphia the church of brotherly love. This church experienced intense suffering as a normal part of their Christian experience. I don't want you to have the perspective that God says, I, I want you to suffer. That's not what I'm saying. I'm also not saying that God wants you to be happy all the time because it will not happen all the time. This church experienced suffering as a normal part of their Christian experience. And I believe as we look at the text carefully and very quickly, we will learn why we can be encouraged when we experience suffering for our faith. That's the caveat when we experience suffering for our faith, because in, in fact, it can also have a great value to us. So we don't need to be uh, afraid of suffering for our faith. Actually, it can have the opposite effect. It can be a time of great encouragement. So we need to understand why can we have encouragement in the midst of suffering for our faith. The Church of Philadelphia will teach us this. Now, if you don't know a little bit about Philadelphia, it's important to know how each of these cities are so different and how faith is expressed differently in different contexts. Philadelphia was the smallest and the youngest of the seven churches of Asia, and its ruins are in what are uh, found in modern, the modern-day uh, city of uh, Turkish city of Alashihir. I hope I pronounced that right. right. I, I was really terrible at Hebrew and all the Arabic uh, type languages because uh, there are syllables that they, uh, my instructor used to say, it's in <laughs> and I, he said, well, you know, in English, you don't have very good throat control, so you can't pronounce these syllables, so it's terrible what you're doing. Stop, stop it, stop it. Uh, so I never mastered uh, my Hebrew. But this Turkish city of al Ashihir is where uh, the uh, ruins of the city of Philadelphia are now. Now, this city was the connecting point of three trade routes, and that was very important. Rome's imperial uh, postal, postal route went through uh, Philadelphia. 
which is why it earned itself the name of the gateway to the east. But the thing that it was known for above everything else is that unlike the other cities, this city was known for its fertile soil. It was more of an agricultural type of city where grape growing and winemaking thrived. There was actually, uh, it was a city where they were susceptible to earthquakes. And actually in AD 17, an earthquake had destroyed Sardis and had also devastated uh, Philadelphia because the city was near a fault line. And there were many aftershocks. So you can imagine living in a place like, you know, another place in this country where they have lots of earthquakes. Um, and they have lots of sunshine. Uh, it's called California. <laughs> so this kept the people of Philadelphia, they were always uh, a, a bit on edge. They were accustomed to being uh, under extreme t pressure and suffering. And caused, uh, these earthquakes caused many of them to live outside of the city limits, even though they loved the city, and they would constantly come back into the city. Now, one of the interesting things about this church is that people in Philadelphia were expected to worship the emperor because the uh, emperor had come and after the city had been uh, destroyed by uh, an earthquake, the emperor had helped to rebuild the city and renamed it, um, um, but uh, because of that, they were expected to worship the emperor. And so Christianity was not welcomed or widely embraced in the city of Philadelphia. The church was in a very difficult area. with no prestige. And probably discouraged because the church hadn't grown. I have to tell you this, and you would laugh at it, but this church would not have made it onto the list of the 10 fastest growing churches in the continent. It would have been on no one's list. Because the church wasn't a very big church. Yet, it's interesting about this church that despite the fact it wasn't the largest church and it wasn't the most vibrant church in that sense, uh, uh, that they were being encouraged by Jesus. And he actually has, as he speaks to this church, he actually has no bad words for this church. He had no bad words for this church. So look with me as Jesus speaks to his church. And he reminds them, first of all, as he begins this conversation, he reminds them that he controls the door to God's kingdom. Jesus reminds them that he, Jesus, controls the door to God's kingdom. Look with me in the text, and it says, starts in verse 7. To the church in Philadelphia... To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right. These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. And by the way, that, now, that word for key, uh, um, um, Jesus reminds them and us that he is God who controls, actually, it's not a key in the way that we think of key. It's, a, it's actually a latch. That's how these massive doors were, uh, were um, opened and closed, when you will lock the door, you will put a big latch over it. So this is really uh, better translated as um, a, a latch. So Jesus reminds them and us that he is God who controls the latch to open the door of salvation, to enter the kingdom of God. He says, look, what he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. And so he tells them, there's no other way but through him. He is the one who has the final say-so. He is the one who has the, all the authority to open and close the door of salvation. And he says that, you know. So I've placed before you an open door that no one can shut. Right? He is the one. And so not only is he in this 
as the one who is holy without sin, who is authentic and who is faithful, he said, I am the one who has the final authority and control. And if, if you know anything about Jesus and you accept his promises and truthfulness about himself, he cannot lie. He cannot go back on his claim. So when he says, well, I open a door and I close a door and no one else can open it and no one else can close it, that's a promise to us. That, that is something that should give us great assurance. Jesus is telling these believers in Philadelphia that he has opened the door of the kingdom to them. And no one, not even the local Jews or the local synagogue rulers who were trying to uh, persecute them, not even them or Satan will keep them from entering the kingdom of God. That's so encouraging to me. Their faith in Jesus was their assurance of hope in the midst of persecution for their faith. But another thing they learned as, is because of this uh, uh, assurance of hope in the midst of persecution for their faith, Jesus realized that they need encouragement. Jesus knows that they need encouragement. They're human. But Jesus knows they need encouragement. Jesus knows that we need encouragement. Even as we stand firm and stand fast in the Lord, we still need encouragement. Christians can be encouraged when we experience suffering because this suffering will have meaning in Jesus. Suffering for the faith is a normal part, actually, of the Christian experience. Unfortunately, it is not expressed that way to us in our Western cultural context. That suffering for the faith not suffering for your foolishness or suffering for your bad choices. Suffering for the faith is a normal part of the Christian experience. At some time, in some way, all of us are going to have to suffer for our faith so that it is not whether or not you suffer, but how you suffer, which is important to God and which is important to us today. So Jesus knows that they need encouragement in the midst of this. Suffering, he says, look, look, look with me very quickly in the text uh, as we read in verse 8. Um, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. So what does Jesus do as he begins to encourage them? He praises them for enduring persecution. He praises them. Patient endurance. What is that? Patient endurance is standing in the midst of an ungodly world and not allowing what you are going through to harden your heart to God. In fact, what you're going through will cause you to depend on God even more. You see, this is an interesting thing about suffering. Suffering will, make either, will either make you bitter or it will make you better. I know no one wants to hear that because we're, we, don't, we, we uh, tend to uh, gravitate away from suffering. Suffering makes you either bitter or better. It draws you either closer to God or drives you further away from God. And why is that? That's because in suffering, you discover that you have little strength. And so you either depend on God or something else, which becomes your functional God. That some, that's something will else, that's something else that we can gravitate to, will eventually let you down. And it will cause you to be bitter. But here's the good news. God will never let you down. He says, I will be with you forever. That's a promise. And that's the reason why when we, we save up our money and we, we have all this hard-earned wealth and we accumulate wealth and then we get sick and all of the wealth is burned in a few short years, then we are bitter because we say, it's your fault, God. Look what you did. And we've forgotten something. 
our dependence and our hope was never in our resources. It was always in God. Because, uh, because without him, nothing that we will do will ever be sufficient. The church of Philadelphia depended on God, not on their own resources. And I know that this is true because in verse 8, it says that they had little strength. They had little strength. They were all so human. Don't think of them as some superhuman uh, people. They were humans who were in the midst of suffering, yet they've patiently endured their suffering for their faith. Because actually, they weren't suffering for, uh, to, to be exclusionary type people. They were suffering for their faith because they were being faithful to Jesus. They depended on faith in the midst of their suffering. And in the midst of that, the church wasn't growing. It wasn't a mega church. And Jesus gave them the strength they lacked to patiently endure. He did not make the suffering go away. But he did give them strength to patiently endure in the midst of it. So in suffering, you will either draw closer to God or you'll move further away. So when we experience suffering, actually, brothers and sisters, we don't have to despair. Actually, we can be encouraged. I know that's counterintuitive, but you can be encouraged. We can actually become better through suffering, and if we patiently endure as the church in Philadelphia did, then it has value. And so Jesus reminds them that suffering has value. He reminds them of this. Read with me in verses 9 onwards. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews even though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. And since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. So, what I'm going to say to you is that he's just reminding them that suffering has value. It's not wasted. It's not allowed and permitted just for the sake of it, just to make you terrible, I, I, you know, make your life miserable, because God is a miserable God. Actually, it's quite the opposite. That's a lie of Satan. Satan says this suffering is meaningless. But God says it is not. So, the first way that he reminds them that this suffering has value is that he says, you can never be excluded from the kingdom. As in Smyrna, believers in Philadelphia experience conflict with the local Jewish synagogue and the local Jewish um, uh, leaders. And many of the Jewish Christians were likely expelled from their synagogue. But Jesus says, I hold the key to the, to, to the, the, the real key to salvation. Not them, I do. And so these synagogue authorities believed that they had the authority to control access to the synagogue and the open door to heaven. But only Jesus controls that. So he says in verse 8, he will open a door for us even in our little strength. Philadelphia had little strength. No one else there to help them. But Jesus says, I am there to help you. And no one else can close this door to salvation. It's open for you. No matter what you are excluded from, because you and I stand for Jesus, you can never be excluded from heaven because only Jesus had the key to heaven anyway. But there's another way that Jesus reminds them that suffering has value. He reminds them that suffering has value because he says, your enemies will honor you in the future. Your enemies are going to honor you in the future. You can be encouraged to patiently endure in the midst of suffering because the very people who oppose you on this side will eventually acknowledge you have been chosen and loved by God on the other side. It's a role reversal. See? 
Listen, I have to be the first to confess to you. I might be a pastor, but I am just like you in one way. I don't want to be excluded. I want to be respected, and I want to be liked, and I want people to not run. Oh, here comes the pastor. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't want to be excluded. I don't want people to shun me. I don't want people to run away. You know, I remember when early on in my ministry, uh, I would go to visit people at their homes. And uh, when they discover I was a pastor now, all of a sudden, everybody gets really religious. All of a sudden, you see a Bible open on the coffee table. You, you know, there's dust all around the Bible, but the Bible itself is just clean. You know, and it's open on a text that happens to be highlighted. And they say, oh, praise the Lord, I've been reading my scriptures, hallelujah, God is good, the Lord is faithful. And I say, I didn't know you were a Christian. Oh, oh, I'm not. <laughs> but, 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 they, but they knew enough, right? Uh, and, uh, and, you know, they wanted to be liked. I wanted to be liked, you know? And so, we, if you're not careful, we'll go around running trying to have people like us. Then, and we can't do that. But another way that we, uh, he reminds us that suffering has value is he says that he will protect you from the judgment. 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 Jesus pr pr Promises spiritual protection for those who have kept his command to persevere. We won't have to experience God's judgment for our sin in the hour of trial. We won't have to experience the wrath of God for, for a judgment upon sin. We won't have to experience that. While believers in Jesus are not excluded from suffering and difficulty, they will certainly be protected from God's wrath and judgment for our human rebellion. And in many cases, God's judgment often involves allowing evil to run its course. But even in the midst of that, believers are also promised protection from demonic assault and demonic oppression. Jesus says, I'll protect you. But another way that we can also know the encouragement of Jesus and that our suffering has value, is that you and Jesus, we and Jesus, will have a unique relationship. And it says at the end of the text, it says, and I'll read with you, since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial. And then in verse 11, I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my, uh, my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming out of heaven for my, for my God. And I will also write on them my new name. You and Jesus are going to have a unique relationship. You'll become pillars in the temple of God. Pillars were a picture of permanence and stability. Actually, after an earthquake, many times the only thing that was left standing was the pillars. Pillars were a, per, a, a picture of permanence and stability. And God promises them That you'll belong to him. That you'll, that you'll have stability in him. You'll have citizenship in heaven. You'll have a special relationship with him. This picture of the new Jerusalem is the future dwelling of the people of God. There'll be citizens in God's future kingdom. Everything will be new. Everything will be pure. Everything will be secure. That's the promises for us. But last of all, there's an, another thing that we can take, uh, 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 we can look at this and we can say, oh, those are wonderful things that we can be encouraged by. We can be, know that our suffering has value. You can never be excluded. Your, your enemies will honor you in the future. God will protect you from his judgment. You and Jesus will have a unique relationship. And you think, this is wonderful. And he's going, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to hold on to it. But here's the problem. 
I want to leave this with you. Willpower can't sustain endurance for long. Many of you right now, you're going to say, I am good. Oh, thank you, Pastor. I'm so encouraged now. I'm going to hold on. I'm going to use my willpower. I'm going to stand in there. I'm going to stick it out. And I'm going to tell you, you're going to fail. Willpower can't sustain endurance for long. I know there's only one imperative in this whole text. You know what it is? The imperative is, is hold on. Hold on to what you have. Hold on. That's the only imperative in this whole verse. And that is a call to willpower. That is not a call to, uh, to willpower, but to submission. 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 It's not willpower. It's submission. Submission to Jesus. Hold on to Jesus. That's the only pillar that you have that is stable. That's the only thing that when the earthquakes come, it will not fall apart. That's the only one who will not shift. Hold on to Jesus. Submit to him. We have Jesus and we have all of his gifts and we have his strength which we should embrace like one embraces a fireman who rescues you from a fire. And you, you cooperate with them as they rescue you with their great strength and your weakness. All they ask you to do is hold on. I remember when a dear friend was uh, sick and was in her bed and they were trying to get her out of the bed to um, get her uh, some assistance, get her onto uh, a, a chair, a wheelchair. I remember when they said uh, they were trying to get her from the bed onto the wheelchair, and the firemen uh, were lifted her, and they were going, what's going on? Why is, we can't move her. Well, what had happened is she was holding on to the bed. <laughs> So the fireman thought that he was just lifting her, but he wasn't just lifting her. He was lifting her and the bed and all the other things that were attached to it, and she wouldn't let go. And the fireman said, ma'am, let go of the bed and hold on to me. I'm going to carry you. I'm going to take you. And until she let go of the bed and hold on to, held on to the fireman, she couldn't experience the fireman's strength and be taken to safety. Listen, folks, each of the, of the rewards, of the images of reward in this text emphasizes the depth of God's love for his faithful people. But I want to say to you today, be, be careful. Some of us may be tempted to run away from suffering and in the midst of suffering, we don't patiently endure. And that only happens because we can't or we don't depend on God's strength in Jesus. Instead, what we do is we depend on our own resources. And if you do that, I assure you, you will, I assure you, nothing positive is going to come out of your suffering. Because you won't experience, uh, you won't become a better person in Christ who learns to depend more on God. You'll become a bitter person. You can only endure gospel suffering by enduring and by embracing Jesus, holding on to Jesus, submitting to Jesus. He is the one who endured the most excruciating and humiliating suffering on the cross. And leading up to it with joy so that we can endure similar suffering. He's already endured and already overcome. And so when we hold on to him, we have his strength. He endured what we could not out of love for us. He made it possible for us who put our faith in him to endure patiently in our suffering and to receive our rewards. Now by faith, we can appropriate his strength his endurance, and his joy as we go through gospel suffering. Then Christians can be encouraged to endure, to hold fast to Jesus, because Jesus actually rewards suffering. Gospel suffering. And we too can. And it won't kill us. It will actually nurture us and grow us and give the enemy Satan, a headache.
because it was supposed to kill us. But instead, we got stronger, and Jesus is glorified. Lord, we thank you for your good kindness in Jesus. And we know, Lord, that um, we can't endure suffering in our own strength because our strength is little, our strength is weak. But your strength is magnificent. And by faith we appropriate that, and by faith we submit to that, and by faith we receive your strength in Jesus. And so when suffering comes and the call is made that we will suffer for our faith, we will be encouraged. And we will be renewed and strengthened and sustained. And we will be able to stand with joy as a testimony to the surrounding culture that our God is an awesome God and that Jesus, who has experienced true suffering, has been resurrected and has the victory. And we now can share in that victory through Christ our Lord. Um, before we finish, um, uh, I uh, wanted to uh, give uh, Pastor Roikas a couple of moments here very quickly to uh, give us an update uh, about some information he has about um, the uh, uh, coronavirus in uh, Hong Kong and China. And uh, that will be followed by the taking of our offering. Yes, it's a very emergency and sudden uh, to share with you. Uh, this is a world academic uh, situation. In China, they, they, uh, they don't let them to go out. They, uh, they lock in at, at, the, at the small community at home for a month already. And Wuhan, uh, one of the brothers called me, they didn't have a worship for a month already. And three days ago in Hong Kong, they started to stop, don't worship the Hong Kong. Hold Hong Kong churches are forbidden to worship. Okay, what can we do? And we, we have a live streaming worship for a couple, a couple of years already. That's why we have a, a well mature technology. Then we, I try to uh, give them a um, uh, online worship on Friday night. And in China, they are very excited, want to come in. But unfortunately, YouTube are very easy to do it. Facebook and Twitter are very easy to live streaming, right? But in China, no, it's impossible. That's why we want to do it. Uh, J Gospel want to do it. Then I find the difficulties because our server is in Canada. I need server in Hong Kong and China too. Yeah, that's why uh, this coming Wednesday, we will try to use a, a cloud. Uh, we, we, we compare using uh, Amazon or, or using Microsoft or using Ali, Ali Cloud. We don't know, uh, we are researching now. That's why a very uh, emergency situation. We have to deal with that. In China, uh, one of the pastors sent me some information. They said, our church have a worship, uh, an online worship. And then I go in and find out they limited 20 people go in. That's mean nothing, right? You know how many Christians in China? A whole China, not just Wuhan, a whole China Christian, uh, no worship, okay? There's a millions and millions Christian. And right now in Hong Kong, yeah, that's why we need to deal with, deal with this situation. And maybe you don't know because we're in, in US, we, we we think that we're still safe, right? Uh, right now in Japan, it's break, breakthrough. Yeah, they spread out. How about US? We don't know, right? We don't know. But two days ago, they said uh, from Wuhan, American to, to uh, San Diego, they are three, go out, right? 14 days uh, isolated. But right now they said should be 24 days not 14 days, okay? And also, the US, the testing kit 
is not working. That's why they thought that probably will four people go out already in San Diego. It spread out probably one to two months. Our worship will stop. Probably. I hope not, but maybe. Okay, what we can do with it? That's why I have to say it. Uh, in China, most of the most of the past are locked in at home. What ca they can do is that online do the, the live streaming to, to uh, pastoring your, your, your church. They say, I don't know how to do it. I don't, I don't have money and budget to, to order streaming uh, uh, the budget to do that. And the church didn't prepare for that. That's why we have to do it. And maybe later I will teach <laughs> our pastor to do it too. If our church forbid to, to meeting every Sunday, we have to do it ourselves. And also we need to, to think and pray for Hong Kong and China.